I'm going to go ahead and start to introduce our next speaker. Hal Schroeder was appointed to the uh, FASB by the Financial Accounting Foundation in February of 2011. And his appointment was part of a, an expansion process that occurred at the FASB at that, five, at that time as they moved from five to seven members. Hal is very important to us um, in many respects, but in today specifically because he year, brings 30 years of diverse experience in investing and financial reporting. Um, most, notably, most notably, before he came to the FASB, he had spent 15 years in all different facets of the investment community, and he has been involved with um, preparation of financial statements and the application of accounting standards from varying perspectives, including the auditor, preparer, and the investor. He'd also been a partner at Carlson Capital, which is a Dallas-based money management manager with assets and management of over $6 billion. Um, he has also spent, you know, just a tremendous bulk of his career in the inv investment community and also in public accounting. So he really can be the voice of that very important group as he comes today. And he also, just to add a kind of maybe the frosting on the cake, can also speak about it from the standard setting perspective, which is so important in what we're doing. So with that, I'd like to welcome Hal to the podium. Thanks, Arlene, and thanks for dinner last night. That was Mesa Grill, if you haven't been there, excellent food, so. It's great to be back in Vegas. It's been a while, but uh, I have to tell you, as I was walking around this morning, and I did a nice tour, I wanted to see what had happened in the last few years, and all the new construction, I, I had these haunting voices in my head. Oh, you hedge fund guys, you're just like Vegas, you're only gamblers. I used to take offense at that, but then I realized these are people who just do not appreciate what a hedge fund is, and they don't appreciate in some respects what Vegas is. In my way of thinking, both Vegas and hedge fund world, investment world in general, are simply businesses. They're no different than any other business. And when you think about it, hedge funds, casinos, any business, it's about tilting the odds in your favor. It's about making money. It's about doing it in an efficient manner and then doing it with a finite set of resources. So you're gonna hear some of those themes as I talk today. Um, Arlene has asked me to talk about a couple things, two main things though. Why is structured data important for investors? Why do they need it? And what's the FASB's role? I'm gonna do it from two perspectives. I'm gonna do it from my past experiences as an investor and uh, in my role as an investor, I was not only a portfolio manager and had a team of analysts, but I oversaw other teams of analysts. I was on the firm's management committee and investment committee. So I kind of think of it in those perspectives, more, like I said, as a business. And, but I'm also going to talk about it from the perspective of my current role as a member of the Financial Accounting Standards Board. And like Craig earlier, I have to do the standard disclosure. And since I have our communications director in the audience, I usually kind of go through it quickly. I'm actually going to read it today. Um, the views expressed today are solely my own. Official positions of the FASB are reached only after extensive due process and deliberations. What he doesn't know I'm going to say is if you've ever followed a project of the FASB, you know the word extensive is an understatement. Before I had ever heard of XBRL, and I have to admit, I did not hear the term until I joined the FASB two and a half years or so ago. Um, I was a big fan of structured data. But let me tell you a little bit about the reason why. When I first became a portfolio manager, every day around 5 o'clock, I received on my desk a very large legal-sized document, about 200 pages long. And what it did is it summarized every position in the firm, how we were doing on each one, it was an absolutely critical document. But frankly, in a, in a paper context, I could not get through all the positions. So what I ended up doing is I found my five or six pages and took an Excel spreadsheet and once a month, I went through my positions, keyed them in, and tried to analyze what I was doing. Now, I can tell you I'm pretty good with Excel spreadsheets. I still made a lot of errors and I wasn't always consistent from period to period until I in terms of how I classified things. But it was good enough for what I needed, and in fact it was apparently good enough 
that my boss noticed it and he liked what I was doing, the performances were good for our team, uh, he called me up, literally a very late night call, I was watching a Knicks game, and he says, I need your help. I need you to help turn around the performance of some of our other portfolio managers who are not doing as well. I said, sure. It was, it was somewhat the, uh, the offer you couldn't refuse. And I flew down to Dallas the next day, and we started to talk about what we needed to do. And on that trip down to Dallas, I really started to realize that the 195 pages of that 200-page document, the 195 pages that I had been ignoring, were all of a sudden extremely important to me. I also knew what the effort was to do it, on, uh, summarize it on a once a month basis and the number of errors I had. So I had to come up with a very different solution. So a little panicked, I got hold of the IT department and they sat down and I started talking to them and said, look, every position the firm has ever held from 1993 to today has been electronically tagged. Oh, interesting. So I, I explained my vision of what I wanted. I wanted a multi-dimensional cube of data that I could turn and, and look at from any direction. When I would talk to our outside investors, I'd actually refer to it as CAT scans. I wanted to be able to take very thin slices of anything we were doing from any direction and know what the flaws are, know where the, the cancers are, if you will. Well, I know how IT works. I figured a couple months they'd come back to me with something that didn't work. Well, I have to tell you, I was shocked. The next day, a gentleman called me up, a techie called me up and says, I got, I think, what you want. And I sat down and looked at it with him, and it was not only everything I wanted, but it was more. What I did not appreciate at the time is that he was an Army reservist. And he was basically working on a project for the military that analyzed large quantities of data, and you needed to do it very, very quickly. What I then learned was that he was analyzing that large data, analyzing uh, improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, for, and how they were being used in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, how do I say this? As a portfolio manager, you don't want to hear your investments compared to IEDs. <laughs> but I got over it. As I looked at what he had developed for me, I, I really came to understand the tremendous power and knowledge that was being put in my hands by being able to twist and turn this three-dimensional cube. What we ended up doing is dramatically turning around the performance of the firm. We went from having withdrawals to having cash inflows from outside investors. We went from having mediocre performance to having award-winning performance for the next several years. And it was a dramatic turnaround. And the, the nice thing is we actually had, ended up having a waiting list. So before um, I joined the board, and started to hear some of the concerns. I was a big fan of XBRL type structured data. So I was a little puzzled in joining the board as to why I was hearing so many negative things about XBRL. And the concerns were generally being expressed directly from company management. It's one of the nice things, just like uh, as an investor, I get a chance to talk to CEOs and CFOs. I get to talk to a lot of CFOs, controllers, uh, chief accounting officers, and pretty consistent message was, um, why do we have to do XBRL? It's expensive, and no one uses the information. Hmm. Well, they, they come to that conclusion why the, that no one uses it, because investor relations, and I talked to a lot of investor relations over the years, investor relations says, no one ever asks about XBRL. It's confession time. In 15 years, I never called IRs and asked them about XBRL. As I've jokingly told Lewis Mathern, I didn't even know how to spell it. So, you know, you can't ask about something you don't know. But that's not to say that I was not using tagged data. I was using information from data aggregators. I just didn't realize the connections and all of how it comes together. So my response has been to the senior management and board members, um, you know, any institutional investor out there is probably using tagged data in some portion because they're pulling it from aggregators. So we need to take a step back and, and think a little bit about, you know, the statement, no one's using it. Now, I think I can 
pretty, pretty well argued that the information is being used primarily through data aggregators today. But what it doesn't say is how it's being used, why it's being used, and what are the benefits. So I want to spend a few minutes um, talking about this. And from, a, again, a former hedge fund portfolio manager perspective, I, I do see clear benefits. Let me just outline them quickly for you. First of all, I think XBRL reduces cost. And if it reduces cost, that improves at a minimum my returns as a portfolio manager. XBRL also improves productivity. Um, it allows more time for analysis because I'm not sitting there inputting a lot of information. It also uh, gets away from the things I'm not very good at. I make a lot of mistakes inputting. It gets me away from what I don't do well and gets me in the direction of what I do do well, and that's analysis. And I would say increases, uh, XBRL increases opportunities for higher returns. It can either be from deeper dives into existing companies that I'm following, or it can help me expand um, the coverage that I'm, uh, that I'm uh, working on today. In investor speak, I would call this a high percentage trade. What I mean by that, it's a win for investors, I think clearly, as I just outlined. I think it's a win for preparers, uh, particularly small to mid cap stocks. And I'm gonna spend a few more minutes on that in a moment. And it's a win for the capital markets. With greater efficiency comes higher quality investment decisions. And I think whenever you can improve decisions in a capital market, which is all about transmitting information, the general view about a particular stock, and I'm talking mostly stocks, I apologize to the bond folks. Um, that was what I was as an equity investor. It, it really improves all of capital markets. I, I've used the word investors a few times and I've heard it by the other speakers as well. Let me just spend a few minutes to kind of broaden our understanding of what investors are because I often hear it used in a very common, singular manner. Uh, however, there's a wide range of investment strategies. Uh, just to give you some perspective, my own investment style was called a pairs strategy or pairs trading. You basically take one stock long and one stock short, you pair it up, and you see, as long as they both go up and both go down together, you can make money as long as your long goes up more than your short, or when both go down, your long goes down less than your short. All right? It's a strategy designed to make money regardless of what the markets are doing. So that's one strategy. And that's generally, uh, pairs is generally included in a broader category of relative value or market neutral strategies. And that's just one. There are other strategies, a uh, few off the top of my head, indexers, and I'll include in that category closet indexers. If you don't know what that term means, come talk to me later on. Um, Event-driven strategies, that would include in their risk arb, uh, special situations, macro or theme investing. And this covers a, a lot of territory. Um, it's about making ma macro calls on policy decisions, economic decisions globally. It's a very broad category. And quants. We hear a lot about the quants. I think of these as basically very model-intensive, curve-fitting uh, types of models. We're just trying to match what's going on in the marketplace. Um, each of these strategies has a varying degrees of emphasis on how they use companies' specific financial statements and the fundamentals and all the metrics that go along with it. They go from, either, from anywhere from a deep dive, and that's what I like to think of uh, pairs trading and market neutral strategies as a very fundamentally based deep dive type of situation to none at all. I could argue that indexers do not use financial statements at all, but think about the, the dollars invested in index funds today. As a result of all these different strategies, there's a tremendously different data needs depending on the types of strategies that you need. But I think there's one common theme between all of these. It's despite the variety, one thing is constant. All investors are trying to achieve acceptable returns with finite resources, namely time and capital. As a portfolio manager, I needed to receive data as efficiently as possible. 
Uh, and the reason I need to do this is I'm populating. I had my own earnings models. I was listening to Craig talk about their models and analyzing data. We had our own models taking all this tagged information, or in this, in my case, manually inserted information, and whoops, and growing forward with our estimates. What would the balance sheet, what was the income statement look like? Where were there holes in, in, in the market's thinking, and how should I trade on that? Unfortunately, you have a tremendous amount of data out there and a lot of analyses and what-if scenarios that you want to perform. But in a, and I started this in this business in a pre-electronic age, in a paper age. If you're doing this, you had to make some really cr critical decisions. You either had to use less data or you had to do fewer analyses. I was telling somebody at dinner last night, most of my models were business segment driven. This was back in the 90s when I started. Business segments with maybe five um, critical assumptions embedded in it. Everything else I, I just couldn't deal with. So five segments, five assumptions, that's 25 key inputs that I had to focus on. Everything else was just kind of noise to the model. I would like to have done more, I just didn't have time to pull it all together. Now I could have put more information, but I would have probably followed less companies and done less scenarios. But either way, resources were rationed and priorities uh, had to be set. And I would argue to compensate for this um, increased risk of not doing this additional analysis, cost of capital was higher. Uh, let me illustrate. I was big on doing business plans. Again, my theme here is this is a business. So every year I'd put together a business plan, try to uh, answer one main question, particularly when I began, how many companies can I follow? All right. And I, I dubbed this the greed is good approach. And the reason I say that is because it's a very simple equation. The more companies I follow, the more dollars I can invest, the more dollars I can invest, the more profit I can make. And the more profit I can make, the bigger my year end bonus. Very simple equation. Uh, I have to tell you, confession again, I reverse engineered the equation. And I said, how much money did I want to make? and then derived how many companies I followed. True story. Uh, the, the, the number in my case is about 150 companies. And you say, okay, I know that on the sell side you can do deep dive and follow a few. On, this, on the buy side, as a portfolio manager, you can cover um, a wider range because you've got all that sell side information coming to you. Well, let's put this in some realistic terms. You have 150 companies. I figure about each company, and I did financial services, I figured about 2,000 pages of information for each company. When you think about the Qs and Ks, the earnings press releases, the supplemental packages, a few sell side analyst reports, I came up with a rough number of about 2,000 pages. That gives you 300,000 pages if you're following 150 companies. Think about what you have to do to get through 300,000 pages of information. Rough math, if you worked 16 hours a day, every single day of the year, it would, you'd need to read 51 pages every hour. Now, what I did is I obviously spread that out over a, a group of analysts that worked for me, but that's, that, that's a cost to me. I have to pay those analysts. And um, I can assure you, they do not work for free. They'll tell you every good idea they had and forget all the bad ones. Um, but the world's changed now. With XPRL, you don't have to go through quite the getting through 51 pages per hour every single day. Now we've put a very valuable tool in the hands of investors. Um, and I think that's dramatically started to change the game. I think that. Um, you know, it's going to make it easier and less costly to cover uh, mid-cap and smaller cap uh, stocks. And I think that, you know, I can certainly do deeper dive, but I think that one of the things that I've learned as an investor is you can get much higher returns in these less followed stocks. So by being able to reduce my cost and get into these smaller cap stocks, you know, I can get the higher returns. Now, I could have always done that. But what I had was limitations on the percentage that I can invest in any individual company, say one, two, three, four, five percent. Well, think about five percent of a hundred million dollar market cap company and five percent of a 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 billion dollar company. 
I don't have to get a tremendously high return on a $50 billion stock if I take even 1% relative to taking 5% or 10% and greater risk on a $100 million stock. The amount of research time isn't dramatically different. So when I start to do the math, it tells me basically don't focus on smaller and mid-cap stocks. But if I can change that dynamic, change that equation, I can, in fact, start to do some of those that I may not have followed before. Um, I think I've made a reasonably ca good case for how and why uh, XBRL and other structured data is beneficial to investors today. So I want to talk a little bit about you know, the FASB's involvement. Why is the FASB involved? The answer lies in the FASB's mission. And the two elements of it. First is improving the usefulness of financial reporting. And the second is keeping accounting standards current. And I emphasize current in the context of business and economic environments. Those are constantly changing. We need to be constantly alert to what those changes are and you know, adapt to standards as necessary. Um, so given that investors are now accessing financial data through XBRL and more broadly through structured data, I believe the FASB must take into account a host of new issues. Um, I believe XBRL is a critical component of all this, and I view this as a very much a transformational change uh, that we're watching in the last few years. And any such change needs, I think, some historical context. Um, one of the things I like to do as an investor was look for linkages that no one else saw. And I thought that gave me a competitive edge. Um, so let me see if I can give you a little example here. Think about the origins of financial statements. I'm going to go back 1492. Some guy named Columbus is sailing over with 40 guys. And I find in a history book uh, that actually has been sitting on my shelf at home since 1973, show you how old I am and how old the book is. Um, it was also the same year the FASB was born, if you're looking for your linkages. But this guy named Alistair Cook wrote about these 40 men. The, one of the uh, gentlemen caught my attention. The royal controller of accounts, and I'm quoting here, sent along to keep tabs on Columbus's swindle sheet when he started to figure the cost of gold and the spices he would accumulate. So keep that thought in mind, Columbus. Two years later, 1494, a mathematician named Luca Pacioli uh, decided he needed to write a textbook on math, and he threw in a, section, a few sections on double-entry bookkeeping and ledgers that the Venetian merchants were using at the time. It's the considered the first known book um, for accounting. There, of course, had to be some illustrations in that book. And one of Paciola's math students decided to do the illustrations, or was asked to do the illustrations. Uh, that math student was Leonardo da Vinci. Now, when I think of da Vinci, I think of the ultimate techie of his time. You know, think about all the drawings and the crazy ideas he had about flying planes hundreds of years before they were actually invented. Um, and I think if you were to ask him to come back today, he'd be very impressed with things like structured data, 3D printing. But I think if you were to give him a set of financial statements today, he'd be a little bit disappointed. We're still dealing with that same two-dimensional technology of over 500 years ago, the same technology that Columbus's accountant in developing the, the swindle sheets was using, and the Venetian ledgers of Paciola and in, in what he described in his textbook. Not much has changed in that respect. So clearly, I see some room for improvement. Um, so with that historical perspective, two questions. Why the FASB? And an even bigger question is, why a standardized taxonomy at all? Uh, data aggregators have been creating their own competing taxonomies for years. So why is a FASB standardized taxonomy an improvement? The key word here is taxonomies plural. And I've done a lot of uh, homework on my own, going out with Lewis and others, talking to the aggregators. And, and I think they do an excellent job, and I've certainly used a lot of the information. Uh, they've spent a lot of time painstakingly developing their own processes for scraping and gathering financial data and, and dropping it in and normalizing it into their data sets. Um, but just like uh, investors, the aggregators have limited resources, and I wonder sometimes whether even with their sophisticated processes, uh, if there's not a better way. And when I you know, learn more and more about it, it's, 
you know, somebody said it was like sausage making. Yeah, you know, it's not something you really want to see. It's very messy. So, um, and this may come as a shock to you. There are actually mistakes in the data aggregators' databases. All right, and my apologies to Thomson Reuters as one of our hosts, but all the aggregators know that there are mistakes, and they're excellent. Let me tell you, they're excellent at, at, at helping you um, fix them once you, you identify them. Some have even rewarded us for uh, identifying the fixes for them. Um, it wasn't much compensation, I assure you. Uh, and I think those errors come from a couple different places. They come from the fat-fingered approach, you know, just making mistakes, keying information in. Craig was talking about forgetting a plus sign occasionally. And the other is from misinterpretation errors. And I made a lot of those as well. And here I was, I, I had a CPA, uh, I had been in the industry, and I still didn't get the classifications right all the time. And I had to work on that. Um, the problem with these errors, though, is that it's quite often they are hard to find and they're even harder to fix once they're in a system. Because not only did they have to fix it for me, but they've got to fix it for every other person out there that's using the wrong information and maybe taking the other side of a trade. So think of it in that context. You can correct it in your database, but once you've pulled the data, aggregators you know, will send information to investors and it's gone off into its other databases. And sometimes getting it all fixed, um, eventually it'll get fixed, but it can take some time. But worse, if you have if you make trades with these erroneous information, you lose money and there is no getting that money back. Um, another issue is are there errors and inconsistencies in XBRL tagged data? Absolutely, uh, but the errors are declining. Uh, this improvement comes in, I think, no small part to the effort that you know, folks like yourself in this room today. A lot of your hard work and diligence is really improving the process. I think there's also a clearer understanding of the tagging processes. Um, there may also be some incentives. One that comes to mind is the um, expiration of Safe Harbor. So having a standardized taxonomy should pay dividends in terms of timeliness, quality, consistency, and cost effectiveness. But I think the bigger benefit is that it allows for uh, the preparers of financial statements to actually take control of their financial statements. I'll spend a second on that. I believe that controls is critical in this di digital media, media age, given the prevalent use of Excel-based spreadsheets and other data link models. Um, while investors may read your paper-based financial, financials, a more robust analysis, particularly by institutional investors, is clearly done in the digital domain. Uh, the investors get the data either from an aggregator, as I've said before, or they go uh, through the same manual process, and I certainly did a lot of this myself. Either way, whether you're getting it from aggregators or you're doing it manually yourself, in either case, you, you've got the same data quality issues. So I think the real punchline here is that, so instead of uh, your paper-based statements being converted by varying taxonomies, by competing third parties, you go straight to digital standardized taxonomy. Nothing is lost or misinterpreted in the analog to digital conversion. So with standardization addressed, why the FASB? Couldn't anyone develop uh, and maintain the taxonomy? I believe that the taxonomy development, as well as maintenance, best resides with the subject matter experts. And when it comes to accounting, whether you agree with it or not, the FASB is the, uh, the accounting subject matter expert here. And we set the accounting standards both for both public and private companies as well as for not-for-profits. Not so I see several benefits to uh, stakeholders. I have suggested earlier that financial statement analysis today is largely performed in the digital domain. And as uh, a standard setter, it is critical that our processes fully consider the, this usage. And to illustrate, in the traditional uh, print format, location of the financial statements really matters. Uh, one of our FASB staff is going to talk about some of the disclosure efforts tomorrow. I think it's uh, going to be a session well worth attending. But in a, in a print version, order matters, connections really matter. As I've learned in the digital domain with XBRL and tag data in general, it doesn't matter. It really does not. I could spend a lot more time on this. I know I'm going to have to watch my time here in a second. I'm probably almost over, no, almost over time now. Um, so let me just see if I can wrap it up here, because you are going to get another session on this. Uh, some final thoughts. Um, 
I believe most investors are ultimately looking for a data warehouse, a big box store, where they can get everything quickly and efficiently. Um, they select what they need and when they need it. Uh, and like I said before, I don't think investing is any different than any other business. You're looking for low cost and efficiency. But I can't tell you that XBRL has completely on the, on the right, set us on the right course. I think it's steering us in a good direction, but we're not completely there yet. I would argue that press releases would be the next stage here of a place that could be tagged. While Qs and Ks are great, today press releases are really what move markets. They are being scraped and parsed by the data aggregators, so you could argue that investors are, have access to this type of information, tagged information. But again, I go back to this notion of control. If you control the information, you can better control the message. And in this day and age of, of digital uh, domain, I think in, uh, this is absolutely critical. And I would put this high up on my next wish list. Um, let me just end it there and see if there are any questions, or if you want to keep on time, I understand. <laughs> of keeping on time what I, it is a hot light I agree with you I'm, I'm just going to summarize kind of what the pockets of the questions were but I think I will turn them over to the ask the ask experts tomorrow because I believe there's a FASB person that will be on that agenda yes. um, but I just want the audience to kind of know what the flavor is and then if they want to pigeonhole you during lunch maybe I think that's they will. an excellent idea. Okay. okay there's a c couple of two buckets one is what do we need to do to really help investors and analysts use XBRL data more so that's kind of a marketing question at some level um, there is a series of questions also around it, it, it appears from what if I, I heard you correctly that the investor really um, does get better information and it re, it's a reduction of a cost to you as, an, as, as the analyst. But that comes as a cost to the company. Yes. And so it's almost as if the, the questions read as if the company doesn't see the value to them. So I think that'd be a great conversation to have as well. Um, and then, but maybe if you could take a moment and ask this one, answer this one question is what impact will Xperia have on the FASB's decision making process? So how does it impact you? And I think that you're going to get some of that discussion tomorrow. Okay. But let me just give one quick example. Sure. We quite often have a debate about tabular versus narrative disclosure. Okay. And there's a tremendous debate here because well, as an investor, I would tell you tabular is always the way to go. It's quicker and easier for me to consume the information. The counterpoint to this argument and I've heard from preparers and auditors is the degree of, quote, accuracy that these tables require. And this is a lot about materiality in a debate that's way too long. I think XBRL has largely negated that discussion at the board. As I've learned that whether you put it narrative or tabular, it ends up in the same place. It ends up as tabular. So I would just use that as one simple quick example. Um, since I've joined the board, we see it more and more at the table with the XBRL team actually sitting there at the table when we're debating and discussing these issues. Okay, thank you. And there's one last area, because I did think this was provocative, so I want to apologize for missing it. You talk about the big box store of data. Yeah. One of the things that there's a couple questions on, on about is at some level, the financial statements, the disclosures become so customized that you lose that ability to actually have structured data. And how can you, maybe that's something to think about from a standard setting perspective as well. Yep. Custom, and it kind of went to what Craig talked about as well. You get so much, you, you lose that ability to have structured data. Yeah. Um, that sounds like a much longer discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, thank you again so, very, thanks. very much. Thank you.